Good evening, I think. Uh, let's make a start. Is there anyone still coming through over there? Uh, let's make a start. I'll just stand here so I can kind of see you all. My name is Zandi. Good evening, I think. Uh, let's make a start. Is there anyone still coming through over there? Uh, let's make a start. I'll just stand here so I can kind of see you all. My name is Zandi Nkata. I am the Director of Business Development here at the Graduate School of Business. And it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you back, for those of you who are returning to the GSB. Um, those of you who aren't yet alumni of the GSB, I look forward to seeing you in class at some point. Um, but welcome. Welcome to the second Distinguished Speaker Program of 2013. Uh, and to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening's event, um, I would like to welcome Hassant Ori, who is the Cape Managing Partner. Thank you, thank you, Zandi. Um, as she's mentioned, my name is Hassan Ori. Um, I'm the Cape Managing Partner of Cliff Take Off Mayor. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tiffany Hoffman is a little known law firm down the street. Um, been around for, for a number of years. Um, it's not for me to talk today about Tiffany Hoffman. I'm here to introduce um, Arthur Gillis. Um, the usual thing at these, um, at these presentations is to read a long CV of the distinguished speaker. But I think in this case, it really isn't necessary in the case of Arthur Gillis. Instead, um, I'm going to take two minutes maybe just to, just to share a few, um, if you like, personal experiences or remarks based on personal experiences about, about Arthur. Um, Arthur is not only um, um, a, a client, but I think he's also, you know, he's become a friend of mine in the sense of, uh, of being quite a loyal, a loyal client. Um, that's my definition of... <laughs> um, and some of you may, may, may wonder or think it's curious for a law firm to be sponsoring this type of event or for me to be introducing Arthur today. Um, but it's not strange at all um, and it's also not coincidence. Arthur will tell you, you may recall this, the first time I met him was at the Graduate School of Business some 10 years ago when um, we negotiated the management contract for the Breakwater Lodge Hotel. I was on the other side at the time. Arthur, and that contract is quite a, it's quite a watertight contract, isn't it? <laughs> um, it, it? It is still in existence today. Um, and I think that, you know, over the, over the eight or so years that I've done work for Arthur, I've seen, I've seen Arthur sell, sorry, together with his, his management team, um, sell Proti Hotels to an Australian investor and buy it back um, at half the price. Arthur was it? But a good deal. Um, it was a good deal. And um, along the way, I've also seen Proti Hotels um, add a number of very prominent properties, expand into Africa, places like Nigeria, Uganda, and include in its portfolio uh, really fantastic properties of the likes of the Arabella in the Western, uh, in the Western Cape Spa in Claymont, uh, African, uh, the African Pride Crystal Towers, and Melrose Arch. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand you over to Arthur and give me, uh, it's a great honor to, to welcome you to this podium. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, all inspiring round of indifference. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I came back from Joburg for. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, I did a talk at the Spur conference yesterday and uh, when I asked that question somebody said uh, I can but I'm very happy to swap with somebody who can't. <laughs> Alright, so uh, now from that. Um, I was told that uh, I had to introduce some, yeah, uh, you know, if you're at a business school, I suppose what you've got to do is you've got to do a PowerPoint. So I was told to do a PowerPoint, and I, I've done it, so 
Um, I hope that suffices. But uh, they did tell me that they're going to, you know, that Mazars is the co-sponsor here. David's here. They addressed me from the other day. And they also said to me, please, um, you must, it's very important that you introduce some statistics. Because people love to hear about numbers, you know, especially in the business school. So um, I managed to dredge one up. And basically, that is this, that 99% of women are not sexually attracted to men who wear leather trousers. Um, which is quite fortunate because 100% of men who wear leather trousers are not attracted to women. <laughs> I think there'll be some of you who are going to be selling your leather trousers tonight. <laughs> 50 shades of whatever. Um, yeah, Hassan, thank you very much indeed for the, for the intro. Uh, last night, in all seriousness, um, they had the Lawmaker of the Year Award and uh, Cliff Decker Halfmail won three out of four for the awards. So well done, just amazing achievement. Well done. <laughs> I've been asked to speak a little bit about uh, the lessons that I've learned and the protocol has learned about customer service excellence. And we're going to do that. And I'm going to share with you these lessons, and some of them uh, pertain specifically to the hotel industry. You are in a variety of different businesses, so I'm not going to presume to start telling you what it is that you should do about customer service excellence. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to you to kind of make your own notes and derive your own take home value or THV uh, from that. So I'm going to just share the experiences with you. The sad news is that nothing I tell you is going to be news to you. Uh, there's not going to be one thing that I tell you that you haven't heard before. I'm going to try and package it and wrap it in a different way though. Because kind of my management guru is a guy called Professor Itzhak Adizas who, uh, who kind of speaks about the, in life at the moment and in business it's like drinking water from a fire hydrant. There's so much info coming at you it's very difficult to ascertain what's relevant and what's real and what's not. And he says the secret to genius in a business, in a business leadership role, is to take that which is relevant and to distill it out and create it, in, or to, to repackage it and pass it on to people in a kind of a simplistic or easy way. I, I don't know whether business schools like that, but we're going to find out. So we talk about the service issues. And the first thing that I've got to deal with is the, the issue of kind of communication. And when I'm speaking to somebody sometimes, the thought goes through my mind, why can't everybody be normal like me? Okay? Because if they were all normal like me, that would be cool. The computer is now doing what? <laughs> this is most exciting. Yes, look at this, huh? Don't turn off the computer. Okay, we won't. Don't worry about the computer. Not the same point. Um, we'll probably get around to that eventually. Shutting down. It's like a, like a trick from the IT people. <laughs> they just reboot it. God willing, it'll finally one day come up again. Um, okay, so let's start off with the purpose of business. What is the purpose of business? Oh, by the way, um, I'm going to ask you some questions, and some of them are rhetorical questions. That wasn't one of them. <laughs> I'm still trying to find out what is the purpose of business. Don't shout. Put up your hand. We'll say something. Wait, wait. Yes, go. I I had the opportunity of studying in America, and my professor would say that's the right answer, but to a different question. So, <laughs> <laughs> hold the thought. What what is the purpose of business? Who said that value? Thanks for playing you wrong. Anybody else? <laughs> no, no, I'm just trying. <laughs> Full of bloody nonsense. Though. Yes, go. Provider service. Provider service, you're getting close. Are you related to him? <laughs> go. Serve people. Okay, you're getting even closer. I would suggest to you, I'm going to put this to you. But the... Good, goodness gracious me. Yes. Um, something's happened. Um, let's just disconnect this. And let's disconnect this. Let's this. Oh. Just kill the, kill the volume, please. Hello. There we go. Good enough. 
Okay, now I'll pull this up just now. Um, so I would suggest to you that the purpose of business is the acquisition to get and the maintenance to keep of customers. The acquisition and maintenance of customers. And that is correct for every single business anywhere in the world. Now, why would we say that? Because the goal of the business, you want right, the goal is to make money. So think about it perhaps like a tennis match. And consider the following. If somebody's playing tennis against you, and their purpose is to have the ball drop on your side of the court one more time, then it drops on this side, you're going to kind of win the game. But if you focus on the goal, which is the score, you're going to lose love six, love six, love six. Now, what I've just told you is not intuitive. Think for a moment about a waiter that is serving somebody in a restaurant. The guest is not happy with that which he has in front of him. Does the waiter think about going back to the kitchen and swapping it and bringing something else and giving it back and saying, I'm sorry that this wasn't to your liking, here's something else in its place. Because they say, if the boss keeps on giving stuff away, very soon we're going to go insolvent and I'm not going to be able to get a salary. So we try to train people about the lifetime value of a customer. Every guest that stays with us is there for a lifetime. So let me ask you this. If that is the purpose of business, things are happening here. You can't see butter all the back in here. <laughs> so if we accept the purpose of business acquisition maintenance of customers, it kind of then draws us to, to how do you deal with that in the real world? How do you deal with that? And we have distilled that into a very simple formula that S is equal to R minus E. Success is results minus expectations. Success is results minus expectations. So, I stayed at the Palace of the Lost City. What would you expect on a scale of 1 to 10 you would be your service level experience to be at the Palace of the Lost City? Scale of 1 to 10. 10. 10, sure. Let me tell you, I've been in the hotel business a hell of a long time. Very difficult to do a 10. Virtually impossible. Because especially when you say to the, to the guests, Hassan, this is something for you. You now, deal maker, deal flow, all that kind of stuff that you won last night. So every idiot that comes down to your law firm is going to say, you're the best now proven. Now they're trying to find reasons. Up until now, what you, what you were doing is you were climbing to be the best. Now you're the best. So it's a big challenge for us. So it's much easier for us to do well at Proteo Hotels level than at African Pride level. Because Proteo Hotels level is, what's well, your expectation of five? Six minus five? Even for the MBAs, that's plus one. Yeah. <laughs> if your expectation is nine, and you get an eight, that's minus one. S is equal to R minus E. All right, now let's just kill this thing. Remind me later, that's nice. Let's go to this. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Could not connect the drivers, we know that. And we are. It's installing updates, windows. What the hell is it doing that for? Technology has confused me this time. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. There we go. Don't bugger me around again. What happened to the other plug? Hey? Where's this other thing going? You, you made it go back in the box, man. That's not cool. Where is it going to come to? Yeah, I don't know. Come, do me a favor. Please put it in there. The people are getting restless. They're not going to pay for this. Okay. Okay, cool. So, S is equal to R minus C. Now, what we try and do is we teach people. It's very important to deal with, on a very regular basis, this whole issue of what is it that you're promising your customer. Now, no matter what business you're in, what we try and say is go to your customer and give them exactly what they paid for. Do not give them more. Again, it doesn't sound right. Imagine a guest checks into a hotel for the first time and we put them into a room. The next time they come back, we put fruit in the room. The next time they come back, we put wine on Hassan's case appetizer into the room. 
The next time they come back, we put them in a suite. The next time we put them in the presidential suite. The next time we fool, so we put them in a room, they turn around, they say, you son of a bitch. What did I do to deserve this? I said, you paid 500 grand. That's what you did to deserve it. Do you understand? What we've done is we've increased the expectation. We ourselves have gone and increased it. So now how you say it, what you say is, but then how do we do spectacular customer service? And our attitude to that is you wait for an MOT. An MOT is recognizable. It's called a moment of truth. When the fan is turning and the brown stuff is coming in a wheelbarrow. Now, I'm sure that none of you have that in your businesses, but in Protea we have it every single day. Because we are 365 day, 24 hour a day business. And unfortunately, we can't all be everywhere at the same time. So inevitably, something is going to happen, and the guests are not going to be happy. And it is precisely there that we have the opportunity of turning an MOT, moment of truth, into an MOM, moment of magic, or a moment of misery. Our opportunity is to convert a moment of truth into a moment of magic. And the first thing that we do is that we all run towards the problem. I learned this when I studied in America. One of the greatest lawyers in America who did a lot of these claims where somebody had hurt themselves and they had class action and so on. And he said to me something very interesting. He said, if you slip on some sunflower oil, which has been thrown in the aisle of a supermarket. Most people run away because they are scared that they will then be involved in the case when the, the person, the shopper, fell and broke her arm. When we run towards the guest, what we say is, I'm sorry, this has happened. You're not admitting liability that it was your fault. But when you show a little bit of kindness, care, and compassion, it goes a hell of a long way. We had a guest that slipped fell, put his arm through a glass table, but the glass table was not shatterproof as it should have been, and it severed the tendons in his hand. We saw that immediately. But he's a professional guitarist. We raced him off to hospital, as we would have done with anybody else. We flew the family down from Joburg, we accommodated them, and they never sued. And most people, if you think about your own experiences, the time that you get upset and you want to fight and you want to sue is precisely that time when you feel that you've been wrong. But once this terrible thing has occurred, depending on the way that people deal with it, is exactly the way that they will, you know, remember it. So let's just move forward. Ah, oh, there's the PowerPoint back. Oh, great. And yeah, backwards, oh, there's the leather. Oh. Right, there we go. Excellent. Okay, so. That brings us to the next question. Is the customer always right? It's not a rhetorical question here. <laughs> Troy, you say no. Okay, anybody disagree with it? Also, the customer is not always right. You disagree? Yeah. Excellent, please stand up. Please stand up, what's your name? Glenn. Glenn, huh? Yeah. Good to meet you, Arthur. Troy, stand up, please. No, no, stay standing. No, no. Why is the customer not always right? No, no, don't tell me. I know I agree with you. Tell, tell Glenn yeah, to talk to you. They're unreasonable. Uh, sometimes they're lying. You know? Sometimes they don't want to pay. Sometimes they're No, lying. you're right. You tell me. You tell me. No, tell me what. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me why. He's wrong. Tell me. Um, this is the character of the right because it's not the character of the business. That's how it's are we going to have a vote by show of hands? Now what we're going to do is we're going to give them each a free weekend at any project so that's going to pride anywhere in South Africa. For participating and basically what I did was I, I led you down the garden path, okay? That, yeah! You must be so shy and retiring! Overrated that big man! <laughs> okay, so, so. I would suggest to you to perhaps think about it this way. The issue is not whether the customer is always right or wrong. But the point to remember is that the customer is always the customer. The customer is always the customer. How many people get locked up in that argument of whether the customer is right or wrong? Frankly, it is completely and utterly irrelevant. 
Now, I can go into this for hours about the way that people act. When you tell them that, if you tell your staff the customer is always right, then what they do is they get, oh, no, no, absolutely, no, 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 you're dead right, sir. No, 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 no sir, you're dead right, no, no, no. They can see that sincerity a mile away. Or the insincerity. You know what they say about sincerity? If you can fake it, then you've got everything done. So, there's that side. Then the, if you tell them the customer's not always right, they're waiting. It's a game. They try and wait until the next time they see a customer's wrong. I traveled around the country recently. And I was on a charter. I flew Cape Town, uh, PE is London, Durban the same day, and landed in Joburg. And each place, I had a copy reserved. There were a couple of people on the flight with us. We had to look at a site, the hotels, and went back. Everything was cool until we got to Joburg. Landed at the airport. Walked up to the budget car rental desk and I said, Hi, Arthur Gillis. It's 9 o'clock at night, I'm a bit tired. Uh, can we please have our combi? You don't have a combi, sir, reserve. You don't, in fact, you don't have any reservation. But I'll tell you what. We know you. You hear every week. Here are the keys to a combi. We'll sort it out tomorrow morning. In reality, they were quite correct. We did not have a reservation. It was an error on our side. It makes no difference where the fault lies. So think about this the next time that you have an issue with one of your guests or one of your clients or one of your customers. That's one of the things we try and teach. Which brings us then to the concept of room with a different view, which works like this. This is now research, by the way. Um, ben, maybe you can take your chicken and go there. <laughs> <laughs> you want to, the question. <laughs> okay, so room with a different view in the old days before we got a bit smarter than we are now, we're not very smart, but smarter than we are now. We used to have guests filling guest comment cards. We thought that was very clever. There's a whole long story, why not? But I'm not going to get into that right now. And we used to get 10,000 of these a, a month. And so we had a team of people that used to respond to every single person. And I walked past the desk because I'm saying how's it to the team and how's it now? And I see, a, I see one, but you can, you can check these prompt things a mile away. They're like stinking there. And I pick it up. And it goes like this. This hotel in Nice is without a doubt the worst hotel that I've ever had the misfortune to stay in. The staff are unfriendly. The service is shocking. The food is inedible. The decor is 100 years out of date. The room looks over the pick and pay car park. You disgust me. You are the most revolting hotel group. How dare you even have the temerity to call yourself a hotel. I think you can guess from this, the guest was recently peeved. <laughs> Room 309, nice. Okay. So, I all this one out of the park, so I'm gonna deal with it. And I look at the next one, underneath it. What a charming hotel. The staff are delightful, the food is delicious, the decor is quaint. What a lovely hotel room 309 Nightman the next night. So I took both of them and I phoned the guests. Now this was in the days, and I know many of you don't believe this, but there were days that they weren't cell phone. Free cell phone days. Huh? The first one was a business guy who had driven from Johannesburg to Nightman for, for a meeting through a driving rainstorm in the Karoo, got in at 10 o'clock at night to find out that his meeting had been cancelled. The second one was from a German couple who weren't honeymoon. Now, that in itself is a problem because I don't understand why we've got a honeymoon suite. I think we must give them the room next to the lift without windows. And just <laughs> <laughs> we undercut the door and we slide bits and pancakes underneath. <laughs> what more do they want? <laughs> they don't even unpack the suitcases. What do so we said, this is room with a different view. Each guest will look at the room with a different perspective. And so, in effect, we see 300 rooms in a hotel. The guest sees one. And we look at it from the wrong perspective. Right? Room with a different view. Cool. How can that be? Can I ask you to do the following? Everybody look at the... Board and do the following. Please say the colour, not the word. The first one together with me. Green, red, blue, yellow. Stop, man. It's enough. 
suffering. Why is that so difficult? Because your brain has been taught that the first word that you like it or not is yellow. You can tell me it's green, but it's yellow. The next word actually is blue. You, uh, so you can start off and after a little while you're back and you start reading the words. Okay, so I'm convinced. I'd like you to do the following, please. Could you please all count for me the number of F's that you see there quietly to yourselves now? Even the accountants, MBA students, graduates. You all done? Anybody want some more time? No problem, that's all day. You done? Finish. Show of hands, please. How many count one? Two. Thank you. Three. Four. Show of hands. Thank you. Five. Thank you very much. Six. Thank you. Seven. <laughs> Listen, <Oops>. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a challenge here. Huh? <laughs> All right. Okay, who can't see all of them now? Thank God for that. At least, okay, at least, at least we're getting somewhere now. Why is it that not everybody could see seven? It's got nothing to do with intelligence. Okay? Does that look at your mate tell me it's stupid? It's got to do with the fact that not everybody's English speaking. It's got to do with uh, it, the English language of is O V. It's got to do when you put two of them next to each other that you only see the first one. Hello, do come in, come sit down. No, come sit down. Come on, you missed bundle all I haven't even started. Come on, come sit down. Come on, there we go. Okay. And some people just say this is a bullshit game anyway, I'm not playing it. So don't you just give up. They say I'm not interested in these nonsense. Maybe when we finish soon then I can go and have a drink. So that's why the next time that you are sitting with a client or a guest or a customer or your spouse or your child and they see the reality in a different way than you do, please remember what I've just shown you. Those things will perhaps assist you in contemplating that maybe your view is not the only one that exists. Yes? So now, when I wrote this book called Juice, which for some obscure reason became the best selling book, business book ever in South Africa, sold 40,000 copies in about five weeks, and it was about customer service excellence, um, because Mike Lipkin, you remember that? Yes, 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 Mike he and I wrote the book, and what we did is we asked people about customer service excellence. And we said, do you think there's good customer service? Do you think there's good customer service in South Africa? Do you? No, I see, yes, no. So now people tell us it's not good customer service. We said, well, compared to what? They say compared to America. I say, have you ever been there? No, the furthest north I've ever been is Bronco Spray. I say, what do you know about America? Now I checked it in the movies. <laughs> when a guy finds a parking outside the restaurant and they know his name and no, that's the movies man, that's not real life. So what happens unfortunately is a lot of people consider that to be real life. So Mike and I did about 20 overseas trips, we logged every single good and bad customer experience. And then we logged them in South Africa. And by and large, South Africa customer service was better. Then we tried to find out why. We spoke to people. And as a result, Mike, whose job it was, and whose job it actually still is, except now he's working out of Canada, we would be asked to go into companies and help them with their customer service. And I did it because I've got a cut full of hotel business. So I, we used to go in there, and you get into the reception area, and there you find the receptionist doing the filing. Not this, this, this job, you know? And it looks like, yeah. She looks at you like you're one more problem in a never ending series of problems. What have you done to go and make my day miserable? You bastard. And I said, can I please speak to the CEO? Uh, he's expecting me. And then I pronounce my name incorrectly. And, and then you, you get called through this office. And you got all these people, you check them all, they're all walking like this. Like Neanderthals, miserable, all long faces. 
some cry. Mm -hmm. and you're going to walk past all the little rabbit worms and eventually get to corner office. Bus always in the corner office. And there you find him. And he's also miserable. And he says, how can we fix up the customer service? And I said, you can fire you, you bastard, because you're the biggest problem. If only, because it's the fish things from the head first. You are the problem. And then you go to some other companies and they, they're high-fiving and running around like mad people. For a number of years, we had a pro sales golf day at the office. We had proper golf clubs with proper golf balls. You can move it, you have to play it where it lies. So you had to play under people's feet, under the photocopy machine, down the passage, there into meeting rooms. It was lacquer. And then they started moving the windows up and they had to stop. But <laughs> until then, we, we did the most mad things. We still play practical jokes all the time. So I thought one of them got into my computer, the bastards. <laughs> That's what happens. And we do that because, you know, you'll see in a minute why. We will show you why these things happen. Because you can't take yourself so seriously. I mean, you're not that good. Um, how many different kinds of people, you all manage people, how many different kinds of people are there in the world? Don't shout, put your hands up. How many different kinds of people are there? Come down, I mean, it's going to be easy act about time. Right, how many? Yes, go. Seven billion. Seven billion. Name them. No, you're wrong. Anybody else? <laughs> Go. Yes, go. Two. Two. Bad and good. Bad and good. No, you're wrong. Thank you for playing. Anybody else want to go? Hands, yes, go. You and others. No, you're wrong. Anybody else want to play? Go. Yes. One. You're wrong. Thank you for playing. Anybody else? Who wants to play? Man and a woman. Man and woman. Wrong. Anybody else? Yeah, no, no. Listen, I, I do this to abuse myself. By the way, you'll never get this right. I, just, <laughs> I get tired. You know? <laughs> Okay, I believe that there are two kinds of people. There are people that are juiced, and there are people that are juiceless. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you a favor. When you work with somebody who is juiceless and miserable, you please, 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 don't walk away from them. You must run from the bastards. You must run, go away from them. I don't care how long you're going to live, you're not going to live long enough to change them. They are, you must get away from, far, far, far away from them. They're going to infect you. When they, the, isn't it like that? You're in a meeting. They walk in the door, it feels like somebody sucked all the air out of the place. Right? No, man, you can't have people like that around. No, it's definitely not in the service business. No. There's some actually like it. No, no, Mr. So. But it, <laughs> so, if you're dealing with those kind of people, I came across a quote some time ago which I, I really appreciate. Anybody know who Sir Ian McLaren was? Chairman of Tesco's. And he said this he said, Customer loyalty is not the loyalty that our customers display to us. Customer loyalty is the loyalty that we display to them. So last night I spoke at the Spur Conference, thousand people. I suggested to them that when they came out, they said, well, how do you do this? When you came up with two for the price of one burgers on a Monday, how did you do this? They said, we advertised it. I said, how about considering going to your loyal customers and doing it for one week with them before you go to your other people? When we launch a new Protea Hotel, we are so yucks to get the Southern Sun people in there. We'll do anything for them. We, we just want Southern Sun people to come. But maybe we should actually think a bit of a little bit more about it and consider our own Protea guests first. Is it not so that the Protea loyal clients of ours are the people that should first of all have the opportunity? So we actually always do that. At Protea, we will always look after the people that have looked after us. Whenever you come up with something new, consider the motor car manufacturers. They launch a new car. They just want to get the people that are not driving their cars at the moment. That's not loyalty. In a customer service complaint, when an MOT has happened, moment of truth has happened, what is the most critical factor in the mind of the guest or the customer? 
What is the most critical thing in the mind of the guest or customer? Yep. Do they care? Yes, important. Correct. What else? Wait. Smart people get smart. People. <laughs> what else? How are you going to fix it? Huh? How are you going to fix it? How are you going to fix it? Very important. What else? When are you going to go? Now everybody's got ideas, yeah? <laughs> what else? When? Huh? Getting back to it. Yes, what else? I would suggest to you that the most important thing is the, is the speed of response. It's the time that it takes. If somebody emails us, virtually 24 hours a day, we've got somebody that will get back to them right then and there. It is absolutely critical that you get back to somebody and say, we understand what it is that you're going through. I, personally, am taking responsibility for it. I will do the research and be back to you tomorrow morning. 90% of guest complaints get sorted out that way. But you need somebody, you write in a letter of complaint to whoever it is, and, leave, and they take three days to respond. By that stage, you are so aggravated that there's almost nothing that they can do to make it right. So we think time response is very important. Which is why in my office there's a sign that says, please disturb. And a lot of people will tell you I'm very disturbed already, as you can see. <laughs> but I don't care who I'm in a meeting with. If there's some kind of guest issue on the line, I will interrupt the meeting and I will deal with the guest. Because there's nobody who's more important in our business than the guest. No one. And that leads me then to the issue of training. And we are in an institution of training, a place of training. I had dinner recently at another hotel, or some time ago, at another hotel group. Uh, and I won't mention their name, so and so. Um, <laughs> and uh, I ordered a steak. Went to come up the table and I said to him, Buti, you got your thumb on my, st on my steak, your little thumb is on it. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, sir, I know. I don't want it to fall on the floor. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so, and so I came back and I spoke to our people who do our learning, uh, Prady Hotels Institute for Professional Development. And I, I said to Mary, but, you know, we must do something about this. And, and she said to me, why? She says, because we train them. And the more we train them, the more they get stolen by other people. She said, what happens if we train them and they leave? And I said, what happens if we don't train them and they stay? <laughs> so the mission statement of Prodeo Hotels Institute for Professional Development today on every email that goes out, it says, some say, what happens if we train them and they leave and we stay? What happens if we don't and they stay? So we train every one of our 16,500 people all the time. We train them electronically, we train them. They can log into our e-learning system anywhere in the world. Uh, we've got trainers that go out to them and we continuously train. And if we can't be the employer of choice in the place that they want to be, well, then they've got to go elsewhere. Then we'll train some other people. Now, everybody always says, but why is it so that the people at Proteus seem to be so juiced and so enthusiastic and so much, frankly, better than what they're seeing elsewhere? And I suppose that you would all agree that what we should be doing is we should be hiring for attitude and training for skill. So, don't quote me on this, but... You can take somebody who's a, they don't have to be a rocket scientist, and you can train them to be a receptionist. It's not very difficult. Check yes in and out and that. Yeah, they come in and train them there. But you can't train them to be enthusiastic. You can't train them to care about yes. So you all agree with that. Okay, but now we're doing theory. What happens in practice is you shorten a couple of staff, and you, you, you agree with the theory, but you apply the mirror test. 
You put a mirror under their nose, if it fogs up, they're breeding your employer. <laughs> then you spend the next 15 years getting rid of them. You find out they're bonkies these people, but now you can't get rid of them. So I fired a receptionist in Durban for not smiling. And she took me to the CCMA and I went there and I won. Why? Because in our business, it's a minimum requirement for the job to smile. Don't bring your cut to work. You can't miss it. Leave it alone. Don't want to hear about it. Our guests had a harder day than you have. They come here and they expect to be treated properly. And then one of the things we did is we got a thing called the golden lemon of the year. The golden lemon is something that we do for the person that makes the biggest mistake. A number of years ago, our regional sales manager, Charmaine Hardwick, was handling our telecom tender. We had 50 hotels in those days, and telecom got bright. They decided they were going to put the hotels on tender. So each hotel had to submit a 90-page document, you know, BE status, and greening, whatever it was in those days, and whatever. And you had to do that in triplicate. So she had a huge box of this rubbish, which had to go to the tender box at Telco, but her office in Joburg. I sometimes take half an hour to get to Pretoria, sometimes take two hours. So it had to be by 12 o'clock on Friday. So she left at half past nine, and quite predictably got there by 10 o'clock. Went for a coffee, went to visit one of our hotels, and got there half past 11. Walked in, and the doors in front of the Telcom house had been locked. They put the trailer doors across. They had lunch from 11 to 3 then. And they said, you've got to go to the back. So no problem. So she made her way around to the back of this gigantic building. And they said, what the hell are you doing here? So she then had to like, go through a whole test of her ID and blood group and all that nonsense. And she eventually gets into the building to bring the box. And she was two minutes late. And the tender box was closed. And she phoned me in tears. And she said to me, I'm resigning before you fire me, because I don't want that on my CV. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, we just lost the Telcom 10 to 28 million rand. It's a lot of money in those days. And I said, Charmaine, Charmaine, are you mull? We've just spent 28 million rand educating you. We haven't spent that on anybody. No, man. And I'm very proud to say that Charmaine became the first female director of Radio Hotels. Because you see, we don't mind if you make mistakes. That's okay. But we don't reward stupidity. So, if she did that for two or three years in a row, <laughs> then we would have chased the heart out of it. She didn't. And, and, and these things happen from time to time, and as long as we can kind of laugh at it. Uh, last year's winner was particularly interesting. Is our uh, revenue director. Um, he feels that we should charge more for hotels in South Africa because that's his job. And he was staying at a hotel in Berlin. He could touch both the walls and the room was two meters long. And he, he was paying three and a half thousand rand for that. And so he sent us a picture of the bathroom. The bathroom was the size of this podium, I promise you. Um, and he photographed it and he, he said to us, uh, he, he WhatsApped that to us, um, Unfortunately, he was sitting on the toilet at the time. Um, and there were mirrors in the bathroom. So, so we had the misfortune of seeing very off. And it was not pleasant, and as a result, he won the golden lemon. Okay. So. Okay, I lied to you. You don't have to make notes. I, I kind of summarized the THU you put for you. So this is it. Each of you now, please, on a scale of 1 to 10, your maker, your creator, your Lord, your God has dealt you a hand. Rate that hand in your mind. Don't tell me what it is. And some people by definition will say 1. And other people will say 2 and some people will say 10. And that's fine. You got the number? Yeah. Next question I've got for you is will you please rate, on a scale of 1 to 10, how you are playing the hand that you were given? Because that's what counts. But I'm going to tell you something very, very sad now, and it's going to come as a huge shock to some of you. You are here 
Because at one stage, in a night of beautiful passion, your parents made love, and you are the result. You had nothing to do with it. You could not determine your skin color, the color of your eyes, your, your height, or in fact how much money you had. That's the hand that you were dealt. I have a very good friend, Victor from Yellen, Craig will be a rugby player, best cricketer in the history of South Africa, went to Lords, first time out, knocked 175, not out. Age 19, died in a swimming pool, broke his neck, and he's been a quadriplegic ever since. In the last test match, you may have seen that they went up into the stands, they had a picture that Vic and his mother in the stands. Uh, he sort of voice activated his microphone. When I got more time, I actually phoned Vic at this part of the, the presentation, we have a chat. So have you, have any of you met Vic? I've taken him there. I've taken him around the world a number of times and he's been here and so on. Wouldn't you say that he's the most motivational individual you've ever met? Yeah. He's just unbelievable. He wrote a book called The Victor Within, a forward by Nelson Mandela and by Christopher Reeve. And when, you, when Vic is wheeled onto the stage, within two or three minutes, you can absolutely forget that he's in a body of concrete. He just loves life. He loves being out there. He's playing his hand at Ted. And in my opinion, he was dealt a wipe. He will disagree vehemently. He says, I was given a 10. Because I would never be able to do these things that I'm doing if I wasn't this way. The point is, what is it you doing? What is it that I doing with my life? Are we making a difference? Because human beings and every living organism in the world is in two states. You're either green and grey or ripe and rotten. That's it. Bug or what else? The good news is, by definition, all of you are green and grey. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here tonight. You've come here to learn something, and I apologize that you haven't learned much, but you get anyway. <laughs> so we had a few laughs. But you've come here to say, what is it that I can do? Is it, can I learn something? Can I meet somebody else? Can I share an experience? That means that you're green and grey. It's got nothing to do with your chronological age. It's got everything to do with your state of mind. My wife, Lauren, was with a woman aged 98 the other day in Johannesburg in the same retirement home that her mom is in. She said, can you please come up and help me? I've got a problem with my computer. I'm not connecting on, inter on the internet and I need to, to deal with the grandchildren. The grandchildren, God bless them, are 40 years old. Her children are 70. Okay? And then she said to Lauren, can you log me onto Facebook? <laughs> I think that's so cool. I think it's brilliant. She's green and grey. And then I'll say to people, why are you so chill? Why are you so reluctant to do something? And you get the sense that they're keeping it in. You say, for what? This is not a rehearsal. This is the only life we've got right now. So maybe we should actually be making a bit more of an effort. Maybe we should all be doing something a little bit more. Because when you meet your maker, you are not going to be asked, did you find a cure for cancer? Did you solve the issue of world hunger or poverty? The question you're going to be asked is, were you the best you that you could be? Within the confines of what it is that you had at your disposal, did you play your hand at Ted? This is your game. You were born to play it. This is your game, nobody else's. Any of you heard of a thing called the internet? That magical stuff that exists out there. It's like electricity jumps out of the plug at you. You just saw what happened. This thing just connected itself. Man, it's gone. That's a, uh, I don't understand. But there's a guy called Metcalf, and he, he kind of coined this. When they started using the internet for non military, American military usage, he said the value of the internet, or in fact of any network, Growth exponentially by the number of connected users. And the key word is connected. <coughs> How connected are you? What is the net worth of your network? That's the question. Why love South Africa? You go to a board meeting in America, they all look the same, they talk the same, they're also politically correct, the bastards. It's actually quite terrible to be there. 
the same in England, same in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Those so-called developed places are not developed by any stretch of the imagination. But I call them third world country. When my internet goes down, I say, what do you expect in a third world country? In South Africa, we have the opportunity of using collective wisdom. And diverse collective wisdom is the best wisdom that there is. Because then we all see the same issue from a different perspective. Different race, different religion, different ethnic background, all that kind of stuff is the stuff that makes this country the power that it is. So when you're putting together a team, please don't put people that look like you, or speak like you, or behave like you. Now, I think that most people are not very happy with their job. But I came across a clip of a guy who's really unhappy, and he has every reason to be unhappy in his job, and I thought I'd just show that to you. Massage therapies for professional mothers. Over time? Don't have. What about pain? I still got to come back to work, public holiday, long weekend. Sometimes uh, I work uh, 12 to 14 hours a day, you know. Very tired of standing for so, so long time. See me? Hello, they said time to go. You can't wait. Only here they talk about what they eat, la, what they buy, la, uh, their sex life, la, who chum, la, who got pregnant. La. See me? Come Sometimes uh, I wish my boss uh, come and like pat me on the shoulder and say, hey, good job, man. I actually dream of having a desk job. Answer phone call, 9 to 5. <laughs> <laughs> One day, uh, I think I really want to quit this nightmare. <laughs> no matter how hard your job is, there are people that are going to be worse than you. <laughs> Imagine that nightmare. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. Uh, yeah, uh, some, a number of years ago, we got a sick note. Um, and it, I really was impressed by it. This is the note. And, and if you can't read, what it says is this guy has got a headache from stress. And the problem is because he's thinking too much. <laughs> and, and that really worried me. Because, because I'm worried about the other people. Probably they're not thinking, you know. That's why they haven't got a headache. Only in South Africa. But life is too serious to be taken seriously. So you really, every time you get, you get it serious, and you, you get wound up in your own monsters, don't worry about it. But there's one thing you've got to be serious about, that's service. You've got to be serious about service. I've seen these guys, and I thought they epitomize it. But it's cool to be confused. <laughs> People overseas, they don't quite understand this one. Yeah. <laughs> this is one that we found uh, in December this year. So I tell you, I have about, swear to God, one of our guests was driving past, he snapped it. That opened for business. Um, you ask us why we got ourselves in Africa, that's why. <laughs> And just when you start to believe your own PR and the things they write about you in the newspaper, you've got to stay out of the competition because it's there. And you will get an AAK, an Attitude Adjustment Club. <laughs> and how many people haven't we seen that got this little AAK? Anybody know who Vince Lombardi is? Smarties. Yes. Coaching Green Bay Very good. Brilliant. Green Bay Packers for a weekend. How many times did they go to the Super Well, first of all, do you know what he did? What was, why was he such a brilliant leader? He, I think he won three yeah, He took a bunch of, yeah, you can have it anyway. He took a bunch of no-hopers, he had a bunch of old buggers in the team, and a bunch of useless new ones. And from there, he paid them up. Got the experience with the youthful guy. He's one of the greatest motivational speakers that I've ever in my life come across. In 10 years, he went there eight times and he won six Super Bowls from nothing. And he said this. This is what he asked his team. He says, if you aren't fired with enthusiasm, 
then you will be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> and I make that my mantra every day at Protea. I love that. Because when people are not fired with enthusiasm, I will fire them with a huge degree of enthusiasm. And then I thought I would get a quote by somebody really serious. And Dr. Seuss says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, things are not going to get better, they're not. That brings me to an Olympic story. In 1984, Special Olympics. Who ran the Olympics in 1984? Who was in charge of it? Peter Uberoff. First Olympics ever to make money. And they ran the Special Olympics right afterwards. It wasn't like these days when they got internet and videos and all that. The 100,000 people stayed in. It's 1,000, 1,200 maybe. Spectators. The parents of the people that were involved and the friends. And they had a race, the 100 meter race for kids with Down syndrome. And even in America, thank God, there aren't that many people that would you know, want to run the race because of the boys and girls age from about 7 to about 11. And they're in the starting blocks in this Olympic stadium. They got all the technology. Gun goes off. Kids are out of the starting blocks. The thousand people are screaming. And one of the kids trips. Now oh, they're not professional athletes. But even professional athletes do this. And a little girl, Down syndrome girl, leading the field, stops everybody, goes back, picks up the boy, and together they run through the finishing line. So now I'll ask you this. Why is it the people we consider to be less than us have to teach us the most important lesson in the world? Is it not so? That Baron Akubatan, when he came up with the dream of the Olympics, the modern Olympics, said, it's not about winning, it's about taking part. And all that we see is this endless pursuit, this greed, this chasing money at any cost. Whatever thing we do, we've got to win it. Maybe there's another way. Maybe doing it together is more important. Before I get to this, are there any questions? Anybody want to talk about any customer service? Anything that I've said that has kind of resonated? Sure, go. Did it? Did it? Sure. Sorry, you use the mic, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One minute, play. How's my end? Same name style as mine. Yeah. So, do you, you have debtors? And uh, if so, how do you collect them if they don't pay? No, we just leave them, it's fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, no, of course we do, and of course we run a business, and of course we do those kind of disciplines, and, and, and we do operate like any other business does. How do you get a debtor to pay? Well, in a nice way. Okay. So, so, let me tell you about my friend, my good friend, because I'm already. Now, when you go to law school, you get taught a lesson. The client is innocent until proven broke. <laughs> so, when you sue someone, when the Australians owned our company, we got involved in a lawsuit in London, an arbitration. We sued a guy in Nigeria for $32 million. We won. $58 million plus costs. And then he phoned me. He said, can I meet you in London tomorrow? I said, I'm in Cape Town. He said, get on a flight. I went to London and he said to me, I haven't got any money. <laughs> and of course we could have pursued him and all that kind of stuff. We don't get involved in lawsuits. And that's what drives them crazy. Is we tear up contracts. If people don't want to be contracted with us, we'll tend to tear up the contract. But if somebody owes us money, they will pay for it. They will do that, and we will work within the letter of the law. But we just don't believe, and actually that's the Sunset Bicycles. And that's what Kif in my opinion, is best off in South Africa. Because we don't go and chase after people and have endless 
useless litigation. Certainly have a discussion about where we're going. But our dentist book is actually the smallest of any of the hotel groups by a country mile. We say, listen, you owe us money, pay it. And then they generally do. Or we throw something at them. <laughs> any other ideas? Go. I was at the gym the other day and I was <clears throat> talking to a plumber and we are talking about employing people and he said what he does is he, when a chap comes to see him, he gives him 10 bucks and says go and buy me a coke at the cafe down the road and then he says he goes and looks at the window and if the guy runs flat out, dashes in, dashes back, he employs him. If he strolls down the road, he doesn't bother. Yeah, then he becomes an accountant or a lawyer who charges by the hour. No, no, no. <laughs> no that's, that's beautiful, eh? We, we do that. When I employ people, I ask them two questions. Only two questions. By the way, you better get smarties for that. You have that smarties, sorry. The first question I ask them, what's the most significant thing that ever happened to you? And they tell you a story. And if somebody can tell you a story that is compelling, you hire them. Second thing I ask them, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you? And some people, and you do that with a stern face. <laughs> some people say nothing funny has ever happened to you. <laughs> and some people tell you a story that's not funny because you weren't there. But you know what? The nicest people are the people that tell funny stories about themselves. They laugh at themselves. And those are the ones you hire. And that's what I do. We hire people for attitude, we train for skill. A uh, gentleman over here? Yeah, sure. Sorry, Mark here. Yeah, no, sorry, okay, go. Okay. Yeah. Mm, there's been uh, a lot of very uh, shameful scandals about uh, most, some of the employees, I think, uh, in the past three or five months. Uh, relating to stealing uh, money from uh, guests. Yes. I just want to hear from, from you what could have been uh, the reason behind the, 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 the various uh, scenarios that have been reported in the, in the media vis-a-vis -vis, um, most of the, 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 the things that uh, employees, especially in this case, hotels could have done actually yeah. to change the, the, okay. the, the, the mindset and compromise in their, their Thank you, mind. good question. What happens is that we have to accept the socio-economic situation that we live in. We had a, a situation a few weeks ago where a guest claimed uh, that he had 8,000 rand stolen out of his room. Chinese guest. Uh, we put the whole thing into full overdrive. Um, you know, police, we interrogated the lock, uh, we checked the video cameras, we've got video cameras in all the rooms, by the way. Um, <laughs> 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 no, no, we have them in the car. Um, <laughs> actually, that's a not a bad way to make money in those <laughs> Okay, so, so what we did is we, uh, we couldn't find anybody that beat him through until his wife came back from shopping <laughs> and said, are oh, you talking about the 8,000 that I took for shopping? To his credit, the two staff members that were about to polygraph, the two chambermaids, were each given 3,000 rand by him to apologize. So we often have guests who forget. We have got a proper way of checking. We can interrogate the safe, we can interrogate the lock, we can check the videos. We, there's a lot of stuff that we can do. There are guests who got blessed and decide that the hotel is an easy target. And we we might focus on the guest, but we're not stupid. So when somebody says 100,000 rand's gone out of the safe in the room, we say, too bad, so sad, you're there. Um, we try to do that in the nicest way possible. We can't be held accountable for, for that kind of stuff. Obviously, if it's our fault, our fault. So it does depend. But, you know, people that do stupid things, like leave expensive watches and computers lying out there in a, in a, in a place where people earn the kind of wages that they do, they're looking for trouble. 
So we do have disclaimers and notices and all that kind of stuff. Uh, over here. <coughs> no, we'll take two more. I, I work in the marine industry. And I was wondering, I work a lot with uh, government business tenders. My deepest condolences. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, we just won a preliminary contract with the government. Now, I want to find out from you, what, what is it? What, what are, are there any tips? If uh, we go for contract negotiation, and then the government or the state says, please reduce by 5%, how would we incorporate customer as service excellence in, into this kind of communication? Because it can be really tough at times. Eh? Great question. Do you see this one billion rand contract as the only contract you're ever going to do in the rest of your life? If you'd like to see your customer, the government, as a customer that you're going to have forever, and if you don't work with them and you work with the government in Canada or the government in Australia or the government in Nigeria, and you want a reference, and this is not the very last thing that you will ever do in your business career, then I suggest you apply some of the stuff that we've spoken about here because that stuff will actually mean that not only are you providing a service but that they are going to say that you were the best contractor that they've had and I would tend to under promise and over deliver because I don't know if you saw Trevor Manuel's statement today he says the time for talking is over he's going to start holding people accountable and I think that he is. I really think that he is. And especially with all of the consultants and the outside people, I think there's going to be a huge spotlight on that. And if you can be that center of excellence, when I spoke yesterday, I did a thing with Ben Sancho, and he was just talking about SARS and how brilliant they are. And everybody refers to SARS as being the center of excellence in government. His question is, why can't the other centers of excellence? And when government gives a tender, by the way, they want one of our biggest clients as well whether it's ESCOM or Telcom or, in fact, Department of Justice or whatever, we try and under-promise and over-deliver every single time with it so that they are ecstatic about working with us. Yeah, so thank you. Last question. So you mentioned... Oh, uh, uh, okay, sorry. You didn't pay me for it? Okay. Fine, go. Sure. You mentioned earlier that you don't use those cards anymore that clients would write to yes. use your service. What, what do you use to get customer feedback to make Excellent. sure that you Excellent. stay the rest of what they like? Excellent. Here we go. Have any of you read a book called The Ultimate Question? You see, this thing, we used to do that. And you know why we did that? Of course, everybody else does. So, I was on a flight to London, British Airways. And they come up to me and they say, Mr. Gibbs, you have been selected by our computer <laughs> to participate in our guest satisfaction survey. And they give me this document, I swear to God, 120 pages. <laughs> to which I said, my price for consulting is 15,000 rand an hour. How many hours would you like? I'll fill this for me and I'll do it slowly, like your people who don't run. But oh, oh, no, no problem. I am not your bitch. <laughs> what do you Put sack, you bastard. And I thought, what about the people in our hotels? We have the temerity after they spent their money here to sit and drive them mad with a million questions. And you know, it's funny how, you know, when the student is ready, the master will come. Then I read this book. There's only one question that counts in our business and in yours. Here's the question. Would you recommend this hotel to a member of your family or a friend. That takes into account everything. How you booked, what you paid, where you were, everything. Just that one question. And then we've got a scale underneath which says whether we're hot or not. And then we've got an algorithm that we apply to that. And the other thing is, we used to have these things sent to head office. So they used to get sealed in a box. But it, and then general managers would be rewarded. I mean, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm embarrassed to take this. How stupid can you be? First of all, the general managers would empower the night shift to fill in a form or two. Okay? They would take some of their bonus and they would come in. They said, you're going to reward me this way? You know that Chinese group, Mr. Ling, Mr. Ching, Mr. Ping, Mr. Pong, they write all those forms and put them in the box. What, are we going to phone China to check on them? Okay? All of them, right? They're excellent in every way. 
So there was that as a problem. And then the guests who really want to complain are not going to do that. So we moved every single one of our general manager's offices to the, into the lobby where you can see the bastard. And they can see you. Because when there's a problem, MOT, they must run there. Because by the time that they hear about it in their suite of offices on the third floor with five secretaries, it's too late. So that's what we did. And this ultimate question is the question of, in your opinion, would you recommend this hotel to a member of your family or a friend? And if the answer is yes, of course, then you know that you won. Okay, cool. Um, it was just, I don't really have a question. Um, it really is just to okay. say. But you're going to get smart with anyway. <laughs> if you haven't got a question, fine, put up. I'm not no, taking on. I was, I was told yesterday that I'm actually on commission. I really just wanted to say congratulations uh, to you and your, I mean, the hotel group itself. I mean, I know, I, I use you everywhere I go. Um, your hotel, that is. Thank you. <laughs> I, I should be so lucky. Um, and, and I enjoy the consistency that comes with staying at a Portia hotel. And you really know all about customer service, and it's always a pleasure to be there. Um, and one more question, are you on Twitter? Um, I'm not, but everybody else in the company. Just checking. No, my problem is the, the, the things that I do are so bloody boring. No, I have no followers. That would be insulting. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what I was asked yesterday was an interesting question. City Lodge, all the hotels are cookie cutter. You walk in, the bathroom's on your left, the cupboard's on your right, the bed's over here. Consistency is much easier for them to do. More difficult for us as project. We are saying that, you know, we, we have the unfortunate position that we didn't belong to the Lucky Sperm Club. We didn't have parents who left us billions of rand to play in the hotel business. We started with no money and we've got most of that left today. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we started with, 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 with no hotels and, and two employees, me and Otto, and then, then we got the secretary, then we increased our workforce by 15%, and now we've got 16,000 and 128 hotels in eight countries, so they're all different. That's a problem with them. But what's interesting is that the guests actually know what it is that they want. So we have a set of minimum requirements, branding minimum requirements, physical minimum requirements, and service minimum requirements. What we do is we try to ensure that your experience as a guest is of such a nature that you are getting a brilliant human experience everywhere that you go. So that's the first comment. The second point is um, I have five children and uh, they all thank you for your patronage. Um, they've got a certain standard of life that they become accustomed to. <laughs> and richly so, I think. And they, um, they, they really appreciate that. Um, cool. So we don't with questions. No, oh, I've got one more thing. No, I'm not finished yet. I've got a thing. Here's the thing that I would say to you. How about this? I'm not a poet, but I kind of drew on somebody who I think is a brilliant poet. A guy called Rudyard Kipling. I'm going to ask you to do this with me. It's not going to offend anybody's religious beliefs or any of that, but I'll ask you just to do this with me. Just say this. Now this is the law of the jungle. Now this is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky, and the wolf that keeps it may prosper, but the wolf that breaks it must die. As the creeper that girdles the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. And I would suggest to you that in reality, the reason that we belong to companies and we belong to organizations and we do stuff in groups of people is that none of us is clever as all of us. And perhaps we can think about this in our day-to-day -day existence. I've done this literally thousands of times all over the world, where we put a problem in front of people. You know, when we run a one-day workshop or we throw out a problem. And the bigger the group, the more diverse the group, the more interesting and intelligent the answers that we get back, the more different answers we get. 
And that really is why we believe that Proteo shall succeed, because we all belong to a unified place. The company was started on the 1st of July, 1984. And that gentleman sitting back there was employee number five, six. How many computers Michael did we have in the company? What? Who ran it? You. Right. Until you discovered somebody stealing from the company, and the chairman of our audit committee came in and took the code of the computer away. <laughs> he said, it's the comp Michael caught the guy stealing. And he took the computer away. He said, we're going back to ledgers. This new old stuff will never catch on you. <laughs> and our one computer was gone. <laughs> and this concept that we have of having started in that small way and building up this group of people that we have was something that, that I am incredibly proud and very humbled to be a part of, a very small part. The heroes of Project are the people that are in the front line every single day meeting our guests and dealing with them. Thank you all very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mark Norberg from the Zars, co sponsor for tonight's event. Um, Arthur, I'd like to thank you for the very inspiring words that you shared with us this evening. I think the take home value for me is the importance of people and the hope of our customers, but our believe customers and our employees alike. Because without the two, we don't have a business. And we need to know how to deal with them on both sides of the spectrum. So thank you for the words and the humor that you interpose into what I believe is a very important topic. Um, as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present this to you so that you can remember the evening and the humor and those that we're going to. Very kindly. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.